Hey, I think we're li- we're live. Are we live? Calling Chris Anderson in London, London, this, London, London, London. This is Chris Anderson in London. How are things in Chicago? Rick Byer in Chicago. We are we are here high above South Michigan Avenue uh, at the World Center, or the actually the the National Center of History Happy Hour. The World Center is there in London, clearly. Ah. Uh. So, but welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, uh, where we're here every Sunday talking about history at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. You must know that because you're here, but we're telling you anyway, <laughs> just to remind you. And all of our broadcasts are archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. Who have we got with us today, Chris? Uh, I see Anybody? Mar- Marcus, uh, Margie, um, Doug, Ken. Margie's already started reading the book, so Margie, we hope you have some good questions for us as we go along. Uh, yes, Doug McCord. Uh, Doug it says, greetings from the state that has more covered bridges than any other state in the nation. Thank you, Doug, for sharing that with us. Uh, and John and Kathy and Audrey, and as everybody joins us, Chris, I would yes. just like to mention something that might be of interest to people. There's a film okay, festival. There's a film, yeah. virtual film festival called the Beyond Pearl Harbor Film Festival that's going on through the end of the day tomorrow. And um, it is. this is the website for it. And they've got about 10 uh, films related to World War II. And I'm not telling you about it because the Ghost Army film is part of it. <laughs> no, no, no. Even though it is. But I'm telling you about it, and take a drink for that. But I'm telling oh, yes, you about it because uh, it's got some terrific films there. Um, I've looked at a couple. There's a film on the 442nd and some other neat stuff, and a film on segregated units and other stories. So just kind of an interesting take on World War II if you're looking for something. We, you cannot watch it in the next hour because you're going to be with It'll us. be right here. You have to stay here, but you can watch it after that. And uh, so... I do suggest you take a look, and I posted it in the comments section as well, so you should be able to see it there. Excellent. Are we are we ready, Chris? I think we are, and I it's been a week since I've heard it, so I need to hear You're the Jones-in. introduction. You're I Jones-in? am. All I right. need it. Yeah. <laughs> The, the bar, bar is, is open. open. Okay, go. Chris, what is on tap today? Well, what is on tap today is um, it's a, a really fascinating topic. A little background. Um, one of my my lockdown habits is every Friday there's a lecture at the National Army Museum uh, about various history topics. Um, and one day earlier in the lockdown, uh, there was a, a discussion of the Endell Street Hospital, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, and at the time, um, I was ashamed that I had never heard of it, uh, didn't know anything about it. Uh, but fortunately, a woman named Wendy Moore has written a fascinating book about this hospital. Um, uh, M- Wendy is the author of, amongst other books, The Knife Man, uh, How to Create the Perfect Wife, uh, and also the book that we're going to talk about tonight, Endell Street, The Trailblazing Women Who Ran World War I's Most Remarkable Military Hospital, a book that Amanda Foreman has called an incredible feat of detective work and a gripping account of courage and determination. And we and should say that in the U.S. it's titled No Man's Land. So. You're right. I'm sorry. Yes, I should mention that. Yes. Well, just if you're looking for it. This is the same. looks different, but it's the same book. Yes, that was the same book. So, um, yes, so uh, Wendy has been kind enough to agree to come and talk about this wonderful topic with us. So, Wendy, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's lovely to um, be with you both. What did yeah, you bring to drink, Wendy? For most well, important question, and we have to ask <laughs> that right away. Cheers. Um, this is actually a cocktail light, really. It's um, wow. mainly orange juice, but with a, a little touch of cassis, which is uh-huh, my wow. usual favourite uh, blood. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Anderson? Just you know, your standard red wine. All right. I have some uh, hot mulled cider here with my mm. Chatley Heath mug, by the way, with the uh, signalling station there at the Chatley Heath Semaphore Tower, uh-huh. so uh, in honour of all things UK-ish. And... Um, yeah, so welcome, join us, and Chris, you start us off. It's a yeah. topic you found, where you found Wendy. I, so. I, well, I was shocked because, you know, I, um, I, 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 I've studied the First World War my whole life. Um, I've set up the World War One tour for Stephen Ambrose, um, lead the tour. I think I'm pretty well read on the topic, but I'd never heard of this hospital uh, and the women who started it. So, I mean, just for starters, could you tell us 
how you stumbled on the story and, and a little bit of background about it. Uh, well, yes, indeed. Um, this is my, it's my fifth book. So I'd, I'd finished my fourth book and I was looking for the next story to write. And um, I spent a lot of time in the Wellcome um, Library for the History of Medicine in Euston Road in London. And one day, this is actually quite a few years ago, but I walked into the library and I saw this absolutely fantastic, huge painting. Um, it's um, a painting, as you can see, um, it's a beautiful oil painting by Francis Dodd and it shows women in an operating theatre. And it struck me because it would be strange enough today to see an operating theatre with only women. Uh, the only male is the patient. Um, but then I discovered that it was um, an operating theatre in a military hospital in London in the First World War. And it was run entirely by women and apart from a handful of men, about 20 men later reduced to about 13, all of the dark were females. And um, I immediately wanted to find out more and to, um, to tell the story, really. Wow. Yeah, no, so, um, so it, this is founded, this hospital is founded by, um, by two women. Uh, are the protagonists of your book, uh, Flora Murray and Louisa Garrett Anderson. And uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about them. They are doctors in a time when it's unusual for women to be doctors. They are suffragettes. And I think especially for our American audience, they may not really understand what being a suffragette in England in 1914 means. I mean, this is a movement that there's there's violence, there's prison sentences, there's hunger strikes. This is a pretty intense movement. So tell us a little bit about uh, Ms. Murray, Dr. Murray and Dr. Anderson, and about uh, their involvement as suffragettes up to World War I. Well, as, as you say, both Flora and Louisa were um, women doctors. Um, so by the beginning of the 20th century, it was relatively easy for women to become a doctor. Um, that battle had been won. But women who became doctors were still um, basically confined to treating women and children. So it was really taboo for women doctors to treat men um, and they were barred from all mainstream hospitals and from ma most medical schools. There was just one uh, medical school basically which um, in London which took women. Um, so they, their qualifications were exactly the same as, as any male doctor. But they were angry, frustrated, because they were not allowed to work in a mainstream hospital uh, doing, the, doing the, you know, the best they could do. So um, Louisa was a surgeon, uh, Flora was a physician and an anaesthetist. And so I think it's no surprise, given the discris discrimination that they suffered, that they both had joined the suffragette movement. Um, so they had joined Mrs. Pankhurst's movement, the WSPU, um, which was the militant uh, side of the women's movement. In fact, um, Louisa's aunt was Millicent Fawcett, so she, had, she was a suffragist. She ran the democratic um, part, uh, side of the um, women's movement who were um, opposed to any violence. But Louisa and Flora had got fed up with demanding the vote and, being, and just being given words and promises. So they joined the suffragettes and they were prepared to put their, their reputations on the line for that. So um, Louisa actually went to prison for four weeks for uh, breaking a window in a protest, um, which was a huge um, risk to her reputation. And uh, Flora really took even more uh, dangerous um, uh, course because she was Mrs. Pankhurst's doctor, but she also helped various suffragettes to um, escape being arrested. And to, um, she would kind of, she'd help them to, escape, uh, to flee basically in various disguises and so forth. So, um, so they, were, they were both absolutely committed to their cause. Um, and incidentally, they were also partners. So uh, they lived together as a married couple. Um, there were quite a few suffragettes who were uh, lesbian couples and um, so they, they really thrived in this network of women. So and, and Wendy, one of the 
one of the things that kind of struck me was they, they had been involved in the suffragette movement, um, again, which kind of pushed them outside society at the start of the war. I mean, those were the enemies of the state, if you will. Um, but the war starts, and of course they're patriotic. I'm not questioning that, but what do you think that compelled them to say, okay, well, despite everything else, we're going to start a hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that you would think that they just say, you know, we have, we have, they had plenty good on their riddance. plates. Yeah. No, not yeah. good riddance, but they, they had a practice. They had people to care for. They, they gave all that up. Um, was it patriotism or did it also see this as a vehicle for saying, hey, women are capable of doing these things and let us show you how we do it? It, it was certainly a bit of both. Um, they were, um, they wanted to do their bit as much as any male sure. doctor. Um, so they were patriotic and then the, there were suffragettes who were uh, pacifists but they um, they believed the, the, the war was um, a rightful cause and so they wanted to you know do what they could for the country but they also did see it as an opportunity so they realized this was the chance for them as women doctors to um, contribute fully so to to show that they could uh, perform surgery and and work in a military hospital just as well as any as any male doctor. So they were definitely opportunists in that respect. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, it starts out, and so they, they have this idea they're going to start a hospital. I mean, they, they have the whole concept. We're going to start a military hospital. We're going to treat these soldiers. It's going to be entirely staffed by women. And their first thought, I guess, is, well, we pretty much know the British government's not going to want to have anything to do with this and isn't going to be hit, say yes to this. So we're going to take another route. What do they do? Mm -hmm. um, well, they, um, I mean, the, at, the, at the start of the war, um, lots of male doctors were already in the army or signed up. Um, and, and a lot of women doctors, too, in, um, immediately volunteered their services to the war office. Um, so, in fact, 60 women doctors um, volunteered their names, wanted to work in the army, but they were all refused. So the, the British Army did not want female doctors. And in fact, one uh, surgeon, she, was, she went to the war office and offered her services and um, she was turned away with the words that have become quite famous. Um, she was told, my good lady, go home and sit still. Uh, but Flora Murray and Louise... <laughs> Nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> well, she did too, exactly that. Um, but Flora and Louisa were not women, the kind of women to sit still. So within a week of the war starting, they had decided they would go to war. So they raised funds. They used their suffragette networks to, um, to, get, to raise money. They recruited a team of, um, of uh, 20 people altogether. So there were uh, two more doctors initially, another two joined later, um, women nurses and women orderlies. And with this all-women unit, they went to the French Red Cross and offered to run a hospital in France for, um, for the French uh, wounded. Um, and the French Red Cross said yes. Um, th there's some question actually about whether the French Red Cross really did know what they were saying yes <laughs> saying to. Yes to. <laughs> um, it's quite possible they thought, the women, they thought the women just wanted to fund a hospital or open a hospital, not run it, staff it, be the only doctors in it. Uh, but they were given um, a, an empty hotel in Paris. Um, the Hotel Claridge. So it was one of the luxury hotels in uh, Paris. You can see the, that's the courtyard inside where the women are sitting just um, in front of the steps. Um, it, was a, it was a new hotel. It had not actually opened. And they were given this hotel. They set off in the middle of September. So within six weeks of the war starting, they were the first women's medical unit to go abroad. And they, within 48 hours, they transformed this hotel into a working mm. emergency hospital. So I think here in Britain, we, we recently um, know of um, Nightingale hospitals, they've been called, mm. which been, have been set up within a few weeks, within about six weeks, to deal with um, uh, coronavirus patients. But these women set up a hospital in 48 hours. So... I think it's uh, quite remarkable, really. Well, they didn't just set it up, but I mean, they, they started with nothing, right? They, they raised the money, they recruit the staff, they get themselves to France, they got all the supplies, they set up a hospital, and 48 hours later, they're, they're operating on wounded. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, which... yeah. They provided all the medical equipment. Amazing. They brought the bedding. They brought spare clothes. Well, then when they... they when they needed to, they went and recruited their patients. Right. They get sent there. They went up to the front to find wounded to bring back. Yeah. 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 It wasn't quite as simple as just arriving there, opening a hospital, and expecting our patients to come to you. They had to um, sometimes almost scavenge for patients. So yeah. they would go out in ambulances to railway stations where wounded uh, patients were gathering or were left and bring them back. So to begin with, they were treating mainly French soldiers, but um, they also found British soldiers, which were just um, had been sometimes left for several days at a time um, uh, in railway stations and brought them back to the hospital. Amazing. So, so, so they're there in their kind of independent capacity or the capacity with the French Red Cross at the beginning of the war. Um, clearly the war gets a lot violent, more violent and a lot nastier than people expect a lot more quickly. How do they transition from kind of this little private operation in France to Endel Street? How, how do the, the British military authorities finally go, ah, wait a minute. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> good idea. Yeah. Uh, how are they able to make that leap? Well, initially, um, the British Army were very sceptical about this idea of a women's hospital. So some of them, army chiefs, army doctors, came and visited um, Hotel Claridge and, um, to look around very sort of sceptically. Um, and they came around, they looked around, they inspected the wards, they watched the women in the operating theatre. And bear in mind, these women had never done military surgery before, right. never, never operated on men before. Um, so it was completely new to them. But the visitors, the army inspectors who came round, were so impressed that they completely changed their minds. They supported the women. They not only supported them, but they became their advocates and allies. So um, by November, November 1914, the women had decided to open a second hospital near Boulogne, at Wimmerer, near Boulogne. And when they opened this hospital, the British army said, they would take it um, under their wing. So they're, they're, they became, this became actually the first uh, women's hospital um, under the auspices of the army. So that then became a regular military hospital that um, took uh, British soldiers, um, was supplied with uh, uh, British army rations and, um, and you know, worked as a, a military hospital. You know, one thing I was, you, you touched on something in your answer there that you talked about in the book a little bit. Um, the the women the women were not as experienced with surgery on men because they hadn't been allowed to do it but in a way um, everybody who was doing um, military surgery in World War one was on a kind of a new playing field because it was so much more violent and destructive and people were dealing with things they'd never dealt before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so as I said, the women doctors, they'd only ever worked before on women and children. Um, and Flora had only given anaesthetic to women or children before. So this was new to them. But as you say, um, the, the wounds that the men were receiving in the First World War were unprecedented. So, um, so that they, they were, it was a shock to male doctors as, just as much. They had to also learn new skills. Um, so because of the um, awful weapons, the um, high explosives, men were um, coming up with um, huge, very ragged wounds. Um, and because of the French, um, the manu- very heavily manured soil, most of those wounds were infected with gangrene. So there were huge wounds, there were lots of head wounds. Um, there were terrible um, compound fractures, so where a bone was broken and it's coming through the skin. Um, and, and also, even at the end of 1914, there were soldiers arriving with, um, early, with signs of shell shock. So these were all uh, really unprecedented injuries that um, all doctors had to deal with for the first time. Well, so, when I, obviously, the, the focus is on what um, these women are able to accomplish, set up, get going. Um, but one of the, the people that kind of intrigued me was um, Sir Alfred Keogh, um, because he sort of moves some moves some people in the right direction, um, and he becomes a great advocate for them. And, I, and what struck me about him is 
you don't expect that given where he was in his career and his position. So could you just maybe touch really briefly on who he was and kind of what he did to make ease the, ease the path, so to speak? Yeah, yeah so Alfred Keogh was um, the top doctor in the British Army. He was the um, uh, director, of, um, gen director General of Medical Services, so he was the Army's most senior doctor in charge of delivering um, uh, medical care to all of the troops um, throughout all the war zones. And by 1915, he had um, you know, realised that they needed vastly more medical care. They needed more hospitals in, in England at home. They needed um, lots more doctors. So he um, had been um, uh, advised by some of his uh, colleagues in France about the women's um, hospital in Paris and in Boulogne, and they'd praised it hugely. So he realised that these women doctors actually could contribute to uh, the war effort. And it was him who invited Flora and Louisa to run a hospital, um, a major military hospital, in the heart of London in early 1915. And it, it was a huge gamble. Um, lots of his uh, other colleagues warned him not to do this. Um, they said that um, it would fail, um, that they were told it would not survive the f six months. But he went ahead and he, he was a supporter of the uh, London School of Medicine for Women. So he did support women doctors. But it was still a, a big, a big um, gamble for him to take. Uh, but he invited them to run a hospital um, at Endell Street in Covent Garden in the, the centre of London. You know, we don't have a, a picture of him to show, but I mean, if they, if, they, if they make a movie out of your book, which I, Lord, I hope they do, um, that, that he is like a classic uh, British uh, sort of stuffy colonel looking figure with a big, big white mustache. mustache and you can just imagine, <laughs> you know, being like that. And yet, and yet he's the guy, he's their advocate. Exactly. I, mean, I think they all had these great big mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> they came with the uniform. Uh, kind of compulsory with yeah. um, army officers. Um, and he had actually gone into retirement just before the First World War. So he'd been brought out of retirement. And he was, a, he was extremely good at his job. So he, he did have, you know, he had confidence in them. And as it turned out, his confidence was well placed. Well placed. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so tell us about the Endell Street Hospital, because this is not a little clinic. It's a, it ends up eventually being, I think, a 573-bed hospital. It is, a, it is a huge place in the heart of London that wounded are coming to, you know, every night, you know, 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Endell Street opens in May 1915. Um, it was in a former workhouse, a Victorian workhouse. Um, so it was, a, it was a very grim, foreboding, dark building, uh, which they turned into um, an emergency hospital. Um, so it had 520 beds initially. Later that was expanded to 573 um, in 17 wards. And the women named all the wards after uh, female saints. Um, <laughs> They were absolutely determined. In fact, the workhouse was called the St. George's and St. Giles Workhouse. And that was going to be the name of the hospital, but they would not accept um, male names <laughs> male as part hospital. of the hospital. So That's it awesome. became Endell Street Military Hospital. Um, and as you say, in, in London, um, in the First World War, there were altogether about 300 hospitals treating the wounded in some way or other. Some of them were very big general hospitals. Um, there were, there were lots of little houses that were converted into um, homes and hospitals. But this was one of the 10 biggest hospitals in the centre of London. Um, so they, they did treat uh, the most seriously injured, injured soldiers. And because of their proximity to um, main railway stations, um, so particularly Charing Cross Station was just around the corner, the ambulance trains that brought the wounded um, they were bringing the, the most seriously wounded to Endor Street. And in, in the picture you can see, um, I think this picture was slightly staged in fact, but that was an ambulance. Most of the ambulances were driven by women actually. Um, and they, the, the two women carrying the stretcher are Endor Street um, orderlies. So 
Um, all the women there were, um, all the staff there were women, so the stretcher bearers, the orderers, the cooks, the cleaners, all the doctors, um, all the nurses, um, all the staff, apart from um, initially about 20 um, orderlies who were, who were male, but everybody else was female. Do, do, they, do they ever get somebody who like, shows up and says, I'm sorry, show me to the man in charge? There must be a man here someplace? Um, well, well, in fact, to begin with, there are stories um, that the men who first came there um, and were brought out of this ambulance into this courtyard, surrounded by women, um, taken onto a ward, all the doctors were female. Apparently, some of them thought that they'd been sent there uh, because they were terminally ill. They thought that the only reason, the only way to explain being taken to a hospital completely run by women was because they were going to die. Um, but mm. they very quickly changed their minds. So the, the men, I mean, it had been thought before the First World War that men would not allow themselves to be treated by women doctors. So that was one of the biggest stumbling blocks for women doctors. Um, it, was, it was thought that uh, men would simply not um, agree to being treated by women, even though nurses were doing this all the time. Um, but this very quickly became, um, it became clear that was not a problem. The, 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 doc, the patients, um, they grew to, uh, you know, absolutely love the hospital. So lots of them talked about it as um, the best hospital in London. Their doctors were the best doctors in London. Um, it was described by the press as the most popular hospital in London. Um, there's, there was there's one pe well, a story about one patient who got there and apparently asked to go elsewhere because it was run by women. But he quickly changed his mind and he asked his mother to intervene to let him come back. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 the patients, and I should say they were all uh, Tommies, as it's, you know, they were um, privates in the army. So there was, a, there was a class distinction. The women were more upper, upper class and middle class. And that quite possibly helped to give them a sort of air of authority. Um, but the men loved their hospital. It was um, it had a reputation of of being um, extremely professional, uh, having very good surgery, very good um, uh, rehabilitation care, but also a very homely, um, happy place as well. And I'm going to jump in before Chris asks a question, just with a quickie, but because uh, there's another patient story that that I loved. I, I hope it really is true. Uh, of another patient who was, found himself a bit uncomfortable because he had uh, met Dr. Anderson before. And I'm talking about the, the uh, policeman. Well, in fact, that happened in, um, I, I think it was probably uh, Boulogne it happened. Oh, okay. It's not absolutely clear from the, um, it was, it's, this is based on a cartoon that appeared in Punch, uh, but also um, a, story, a story that was handed down um, in the family of um, Louisa Garrett Anderson. Uh, but. Um, one of her patients um, recognised her and um, he, he uh, revealed that he, he was a policeman. So he'd um, an, originally arrested her when she'd been <laughs> in a, a suffragette protest. So the tables had very definitely turned And be there. careful of what you do <laughs> in one day and they come back on you the next day. Yeah. So, uh, Wendy, I, I want to back up a little bit. Um, first to work in a question that we had from uh, Peter. Uh, he wanted to know uh, what happened to the hospitals that they had had operated in France. Um, mm -hmm. And then leading on from that, just to kind of give people a sense of what is happening. Um, I'm a, say I'm a Tommy, I'm on the Somme, I'm wounded. What happens to me? What's the, the chain of care and how do I find myself all of a sudden in London? Okay, uh, well, the, the first question then, um, the hospital in Paris closed at the end of 1914. Um, really, that's because the war had shifted, the, the, um, the, the front had shifted, and so most of the British medical hospitals had moved to the coast. Um, so that's really why they had set up their hospital near Boulogne. Um, and because um, they were then asked to run a bigger hospital in the centre of London, they closed their hospital in, in Boulogne. So in fact, that building, it was a, it was a little hotel called the Chateau in Mauricien, um, was um, used as a, as a hospital for, by some other um, people. Okay. Um, but they closed their French hospital so they could concentrate on running 
the hospital in the centre of London. Um, and then I think, uh, Chris, you were asking about the, um, how men got from being wounded in the trenches yeah. to um, arriving at a bed in Endrell Street. Right. And it could be quite a long process. Um, it was called the chain of evacuation. And the principle was that um, if you were wounded, you were carried back behind the lines by regimental stretcher bearers, probably taken to a first aid post, to, then to a field hospital. You might uh, um, possibly have an emergency um, operation um, at a field hospital if you needed it. Um, you, you, might, you might then get taken further back by ambulance train to um, a base hospital, which would have been on the coast in France. From there, you go in a hospital ship across the channel to usually Southampton. And from Southampton, you would be taken by ambulance train to um, various hosp military hospitals mm. in England, but many of them came to London. And so the, so the men would arrive by ambulance train at one of the stations in London. Um, they, the, the trains often arrived in the middle of the night, so the convoys often came to the military hospitals in the middle of the night. Um, so the men would be unloaded um, by stretcher bearers into ambulances. Often, in the daytime, there often would be huge crowds of people gathering around, waiting to uh, greet the wounded. And some of them would um, shower them with um, flowers or cigarettes. Or Some of them were actually trying to find you know, whether um, their loved one was there. So it was a very um, emotional scene. But, um, but most of the convoys arrived in the middle of the night. So this ambulance would arrive in the courtyard. The, um, there'd be a bell that would ring in the courtyard of the hospital to alert the women on duty. And they would be sleeping in the hospital. They'd have to hurriedly get dressed, uh, run down into the courtyard, ready to meet the ambulance and un unload the wounded. It, it's, it's um, you know, it's pretty amazing. And one of the things that really struck me reading this book is that, um, of course, most, most military history, I think it's fair to say, is written by men. And when somebody is wounded and they, they kind of leave the story, a lot of the times and you you maybe you get a glimpse of them you know later in the hospital when somebody comes to visit them or you hear about them having gone back home after treatment but you don't really see this um this scene that you have described so well and obviously you've described it in the context of the women's military hospital but it's 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 grueling this this constant flow of horribly wounded people that is just uh it is just it is a pretty gruesome uh, um, 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 an intense scene, and I, I was struck by one passage that you wrote, and I just, um, it's a, or it's actually a quote that you quoted from a suffragette journalist, Evelyn Sharp, who we were talking about before the broadcast, observing the care at the hospital, and she complains about, quote, the bitter irony of our civilization, which first compels men to tear one another to pieces like wild beasts for no personal reason and then applies all of its art to patching them up in order to let them do it all over again. And when the patching is done by women, she wrote, the ironic tragedy of the whole thing seems more evident. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I think um, a lot of the women felt very aware of that, that um, if they did their work uh, to their best ability, they were um, patching men up to send them back to the front. Um, so they were very conflicted about that. Um, uh, Flora Murray herself talks about how difficult it was to think that um, they were saving these men's lives. And that's, that's Flora Murray in her office, actually, in the hospital uh, with um, three of the patients um, who um, come standing to attention uh, while she's... I think she's probably given them um, their discharge. Um, so she, she might be so sending this, them this, back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She is probably sending these men back to, to the front. So, yeah, I think they were very much aware of that. Um, but they were. They were also. Um, I think. I think it's true to say that, um, the women themselves found a much closer, or better understanding of men, during, during this work as well. Because I think before, 
Um, they'd seen men as pretty much the enemy in their fight for the vote. Um, and it, they did come to understand um, and really sympathise with these men um, and became very um, you know, emotionally attached to a lot of them. Um, so, so yes, the men obviously died in their hospital and there were some um, you know, very sad funerals. Um, some of the men were sent back to the front and some then died at the front um, and other men were horribly um, injured and um, their lives um, were never going to be the same again. So they might not be able to work again, um, they might not be able to walk again. Um, so I, they were very much aware of um, the, um, you know, the poignancy of what they were doing. So Rick, we've got a some questions you want to pop them up or should i go again yeah well let's let's start with uh uh because i think this is a really good question to right. ask here from thomas uh wendy can you describe some of the advancements in medical treatment that these women discovered or pioneered because that is also a great part of the story good very good question thomas um yes of course um so I, I think in general, um, the, the Endell Street was known for being a very good hospital at rehabilitation. So they took a lot of care to fit men with the right appliances um, and artificial limbs to enable them to walk. Um, they also um, were well known for um, their surgery. Um, Louisa Garrett Anderson was um, highly respected within the medical profession for her um, extreme delicacy. So. There's one description of um, one doctor who comes to watch her do a brain operation and he's you know, really kind of um, impressed at her uh, dexterity. Um, but there's a very, um, uh, quite a major um, uh, initiative that they also pioneered. Um, by the time of the Battle of the Somme, um, a lot of the um, wounds were still very heavily infected and they pioneered a new antiseptic ointment um, and it was called bismuth um, iodoform paraffin paste um, and it, it rolls off the tongue beautifully it does <laughs> that's why it was called, that's why it was known as bip for short um, <laughs> and you do read of, um, of patients being bipped and even rebipped sometimes um, but essentially this was um, a paste um, it wasn't um, invented by them there was a uh, a doctor in a military hospital in the north who tried it on his uh, patients and because he thought it was uh, it was successful he sent it to um, Endo Street for a, a bigger trial um, so it was a kind of paste that they put on the wounds and they could actually leave it in place for uh, several days up to 10 days without changing the dressings so that what that meant was that it was much less painful for the men because for a lot of patients, the worst bit of their treatment was having their dressings changed. And it was also much less uh, time consuming for the women. And they found that this paste um, was very successful in, um, uh, in fighting the infection. Um, th there were lots of other um, methods of, um, of antiseptic or um, infection control at the time, um, various others, but this one, um, and they continued to be used but this one was um, certainly adopted by many other hospitals too and, and um, you said it's it's still used today it right? is still used in some uh, facial surgery as i yeah, understand wow. it yes yeah but i think the other thing to bear in mind is i mean so they were medical pioneers but i think perhaps the way the most pioneering thing they did was a different approach um, right. because louisa garrett anderson said that she believed most of the men were more wounded in their minds than in their bodies. So they were very much aware of the, the mental impact the war was having on these men. Um, and that's Louisa with her, her two dogs. Um, they had uh, two Scotty dogs who were called, um, uh, I can't remember the second, Garrett and, um, uh, I can't remember the other one. Um, but they were like the two Sorry, I didn't mean the... to interrupt your train of thought there. It's just I, <laughs> you mentioned <laughs> her and okay. I was trying to get the picture in. So. That's okay then. Um, so yes, so she really understood that the men needed um, their spirits raising um, to be diverted from um, their wounds. So they put a lot of effort into making the hospital as homely as they possibly could. 
They had um, bright coloured walls, they had colourful bed quilts, they had fresh flowers on every ward. And the courtyard, which had been this very kind of dark and grim um, exercise pen in the workhouse, they turned that into a um, very green, uh, sort of tranquil um, sanctuary. They brought in um, all kinds of entertainers. So they had um, magic shows and um, uh, boxing performances. They had concerts and they had plays, pantomimes every Christmas. So there was something going on all the time. So there was hardly any time really for the patients to think about themselves. Um, so they, they really did um, put everything into making life there as joyful as they, as they could, really. Well, I, I really enjoyed the uh, <laughs> when you mentioned that the, the policy of the library was any book a patient wants in any <laughs> language, he'll get. you got to like that. That's um, right. They had yeah. a library with, um, I think, 5,000 books and a theatre yeah. as well. So, and the library was run by two, um, two authors. So, um, uh, yeah, they, a lot of the soldiers initially... Uh, didn't want to read at all or some of them couldn't read so they would the li the two women authors would go around the hospital and try and tempt the men by um, initially giving them um, picture books or magazines and then encourage them to read something a bit more challenging and they would kind of they were a little bit um, snobby so they would say <laughs> eventually some of the men ended up eat reading Shakespeare so yeah. <laughs> they thought that was um, obviously a, a, um, a success um, yeah. But they did everything they possibly could to make the men's lives more bearable. So, Wendy, one of the things that strikes me is, in reading some of the, the press accounts of the hospital, at the beginning of your book, some of them seem almost patronizing. The, the accounts in the press, like, look at these women, isn't this fun? You know, clearly, as this goes on, that's not the case. And you have some wonderful stories in the book. One of it is a of a private crouch who's been wounded at Gallipoli. He somehow makes it back to, to England. He gets off at the train station. He goes up to a taxi cab and he says, take me to the best hospital in London. Now London's full of hospitals and this cabbie knows you take him to Endell Street. <laughs> so clearly they have a reputation um, that's well deserved, but are they aware that they're changing minds and, and how does that transformation happen from being sort of, oh, isn't this cute, to this is the best game in town. Mm -hmm. Well, as you say, I think initially the press response was, yes, this is a, a great novelty. This, you know, look at these women trying to run a hospital, all big, all great fun. And they were, they were held up as being, you know, part of this blighty spirit of fighting the war. Um, but um, the, uh, the women made a big point of inviting the press in. So they were very much aware of what they were doing and that they were blazing a trail. Uh, so they, um, they had pictures taken themselves of the hospital. Um, that is one of the ones that they had taken, an absolutely fabulous picture of the whole of the hospital staff, including um, the, the handful of men as well, taken in 1916. Um, they, um, Flora Murray actually um, kept a scrapbook. So she cut out all of the newspaper articles about industry and this scrapbook you know is an absolute treasure trove um, so there are all these wonderful articles um, describing the hospital and you do see the change where it becomes more acceptant more that they're taken as, um, as for the norm um, they're, they're still regarded as being um, you know they often describe as being you know the most popular the the most successful um, but um, I think the women were very much aware they wanted to record what they were doing and, um, and were making a point. They were proving their point that they could do the work they were doing as well as any men. Um, and in fact, after the war, Flora Murray wrote a book about the experience. And she, that, was for her, that was her saying, this is what women can do. And I think it's really important that... Um, they had the suffragette motto um, in their yeah, hospital right. on, above the theatre. So deeds, not words. Um, and that's what they were showing by deeds, not words, that women could do everything that um, men could do and therefore deserve the vote. 
So we have a, a bunch of questions. So I am going to invent a new feature of our show, Chris, right <laughs> okay. now on the okay. spot. All right. It's the lightning round of History Happy <laughs> Hour. Bing. Okay. Yeah, right. So we're looking so I'll for. I'll shut up now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, we'll throw a few questions at you, Wendy, that I think you can do uh, uh, short answers to. So here's the first one Where did they get their funding? Did the government provide the money? Uh, well, yeah, it was a military hospital under the auspices of the British Army. So it was funded by the War Office, just the same as any other military hospital. And all the women staff were paid um, army, army pay. So they were paid according to the, the honorary rank. They weren't given proper rank, but they were given um, honorary rank. And they, that's how they were paid. OK, second question here. Did they treat Commonwealth soldiers as well from Australia, Canada, etc.? Yep, very much so. Um, they treated uh, many Australian and New Zealand soldiers who were wounded at Gallipoli. Um, they had lots of Canadian um, soldiers uh, came there. And in fact, there was one point when the Canadian soldiers were told they would all have to go to their own Canadian hospital in London. And some of them refused to go because they wanted <laughs> to stay at Endor Street. Uh, they also had women doctors who came from um, uh, overseas. So they had four surgeons who came from Australia and uh, a, a doctor from um, Canada who was an anaesthetist as well. Uh, the third, third of four questions here. Did they treat officer level wounded? They, they treated some, but that wasn't the norm because um, officers generally were sent to hospitals um, for officers in London. And in fact, they, they went there, they went into kind of these kind of plush luxury townhouses and hotels is where the officers were sent, where they had special menus and they could order wine with their dinner. Um, so most of the soldiers who came to Endra Street were Tommies. Um, but when there was a big push, there wasn't really enough time to sort the, the um, men. So they did have officers too at times. And, and how did the men behave? We got that question as well. That is a very good question because the women were really hot on discipline. Uh, so they had very strict discipline for the staff. Um, the t Flora and Louisa were known really as kind of a bit of a, a battle axe, actually, because um, <laughs> the women were in fear of them, but respected them hugely as well. And that went for the men too. So um, they, um, they had um, a, a couple of male um, corporals um, from the Royal Army Medical Corps who went to other hospitals too. And they were always saying that discipline at Endor Street was better than anywhere else. Um, and one patient um, said, so occasionally the patients would be in trouble for going out and not coming back in time if they were um, recuperating. Um, but one patient said, all, ha all that happened was you get sent to Flora Murray and um, he, they would end up in tears, they'd be so really embarrassed by uh, being ticked off by her. So, um, yeah, discipline was very, very good. So, Wendy, I, there are a couple... Th uh, 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 no, no, the lightning round is over. Right. It's, you're, you're, right. The ball is in your court. There are a couple other things I want to get to, but one last question I did want to come up, because one of the things you talk about is just um, the volume of work. And, and you can, as you read, you can see that it's really starting to affect mm -hmm. the women because they're just constantly working mm -hmm. and seeing these things. And um, Brian... Peacock wanted to know um, about PTSD. Did any of them comment? Of, I mean, were they even aware of what was happening and, and how did they maybe handle that? Yeah, I don't think they defined it in any way, but it's very evident from the letters and um, other um, sources that the women were um, suffering um, quite severely in some way. So that some of the orderlies talk about uh, it was obviously very grueling. They were often working very long hours. Uh, sometimes the orderlies who did a lot of the nursing care um, were on wards on their own at night. Um, some of them did get ill through fatigue. And um, in particular, one, one of the um, sources that was most useful for me, because I think a lot of the um, writing about Enter Street by Flora and Louisa was really saying how wonderful it is, you know, how fantastic it is, everything's perfect. But um, there was um, a, a diary written by an Australian surgeon and she was very honest about how she felt. So she, um, she would often say in her diary, um, and these were letters that she sent home in the form of a diary, that um, she hated military surgery. So she found it very 
um, hard to deal with. She was constantly on the verge of um, giving up and and um, going to work with children. Uh, so it's definitely evident that the women were suffering, uh, and especially as the war went on, uh, because they were suffering from uh, food shortages. There were air raids by zeppelins. Um, there were, um, uh, you know, they were working very long hours, and and it very it seemed as if the war was never going to end. So you definitely get the sense of them being very tired, uh, very fed up, and um, you know, really wanting an end to it. Yeah. And, and so, then we've got, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I was just going to say, then the war ends and there's a pandemic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they have to deal with that as well. They stay open for another year, something yeah. like that, after the yeah. war, partly because of the pandemic and partly to continue dealing with wounded. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. At what, the end of the, well, I was going to say, at the end of the war, most military hospitals closed. But Endell Street was one of the few that stayed open in London, and that was to treat um, victims of the pandemic. So they uh, treated um, many soldiers who came back um, from the war with Spanish flu, um, and also some civilians as well, and some women um, who, who'd been serving in the war. And, and that was really the worst time for them, uh, because throughout the war they did keep going, because... They had this sense of togetherness, of fighting a common enemy, of keeping spirits high. But then when the Spanish flu came, um, they were fighting this invisible enemy and um, they, couldn't, they were powerless to do anything really. They'd saved men's lives and um, saved men from terrible disability throughout the war. But there was very little they could do against the Spanish flu. Sorry, I think I might have lost you. Lost me. No, nope. no, I think we got most we got, of it. Got. So, so what, one of the things I, I just wanted ah, to ask good. real quick. Okay. So, I no, wanted to get it, heard it. get in real quick um, because as time is going on, um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about the hazard unit? Because as an American, uh, America largely American audience, we have some American nurses or volunteers coming. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about them because I, my head exploded because there's a wonderful connection with uh, some of our other guests. And anyway, if you yeah. could let well, folks well, know that. By, by 1918, um, everybody was desperate for the Americans to come and save, um, save uh, the war, basically. And Endless Street um, was the same in some ways. The women were very tired by then. They were uh, short of staff because a lot of women staff had by then gone to work elsewhere. And so they wrote to a friend in America, uh, Dora Hazard, and asked if she could uh, find some American women who could go and work at Endell Street. So she recruited 20 American women and they sailed um, in the summer of 1918 and arrived at Endell Street and they worked there as orderlies. And two of them were um, uh, Marion Dickerman and Nancy Cook, who were very good friends of Eleanor Roosevelt. Yep. Um, so they they described <laughs> their um, <laughs> they described their time, and they they became very uh, good friends with the other women at Endell Street. Yeah. One of the stories I found so fascinating was was it uh, Miss Cook who was the carpenter, or I can't remember yeah. now, but but that's right. She started by making prosthetic legs at Endell Street and got the bug to make furniture. So when she comes back to America, she wants to set up a furniture business at Valkill. And so Eleanor helps her set that up. Yeah. Eleanor becomes first lady and she wants to decorate the White House with furniture made by this woman who started at Endless And Street. Eleanor yeah. essentially lived with uh, with uh, Dickerman and uh, Cook uh, at, at Valkill. I mean, that's how uh, yeah. Valkill got started. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I mean, I think there's probably a whole book that could be written about their relationship, actually. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to so, be able to travel, to, I think, to America for that. Do you yes. have a big wrap-up question, Chris? Or Well, uh, I have I have a, a wrap-up question and an observation. So what all right, we do? go for it. Oh, okay. So um, they've, they've blazed a trail. They've saved thousands of lives. I'm sure they made a huge impact. Uh, on the British medical profession, and I'm sure that uh, British military authorities saw the value of their work and enshrined them in history, and that's why we know about them. But I'm thinking that's not really what happens, is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think for me, the saddest part 
of writing the book was when the war ended and the hospital closed in 1919, the women then were, had to go back to doing exactly what they had done before. So they got the vote, they proved they could run a military hospital, that women could be surgeons, but they were told, right, thank you very much, time to go back to your old jobs, treating women and children. So um, the women surgeons were um, not allowed to treat men again. Um, the um, medical schools, which had allowed women students in during the war, now closed their doors again. Hos mainstream hospitals, which had actually remained open through the war with the help of women doctors, now um, sent those women away and only employed men again. So it felt as if they had shown they could do it, but um, gained nothing. And how perfectly predictable. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I you know, Endell Street, uh, the, to kind of pick up on the second half of Chris's question, Endell Street, famous in its day, neither he nor I had ever heard of it. Um, uh, history is what we choose to remember. I guess, why, why do we, why did we as a society n not remember really as much as we should have what happened at Endell Street and what is kind of the legacy of that for us? Mm. I think it's like so much of women in history, um, their stories are forgotten. Um, most, because mostly men want write history and because mostly men are in positions of power. So what women do um, seems to get um, lost or forgotten. Um, and that's very much the case with Endor Street. Um, and the hospital itself doesn't exist anymore. It was, it was eventually demolished, so that hasn't helped. Um, but I think there are, are loads, lots more women in history whose um, lives need to be told. Well, I, no, I was just going to say, you know, what really struck me, I guess, kind of how I wrapped it up was um, I was really moved by the story of Daisy Wadling, who was, um, you describe as a young woman who volunteered to work in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, she works through the war. She works um, and gets the influenza, taking care of people during this pandemic. Um, and, and she dies on it, uh, very quickly. Um, and she's buried on Armistice Day. Mm. Um, and the soldiers who helped at the hospital are her pallbearers. Her casket is draped with the Union Jack. Um, and they play last post for her, which mm -hmm. is the soldiers' farewell to their comrades. So mm -hmm. I thought that was mm -hmm. very moving. Yes, well, and yes, she was one of the many um, patients who died of the flu in the hospital. There were also four women staff who died of the flu. Um, and um, Flora Murray herself, she died in 1923 um, of cancer, uh, but I think she was really exhausted, worn yeah. down by the war, and she too had a military funeral where the last post was played, um, and it, that, that for me was very emotional yeah. to write about that. Well, I want to say, Wendy Moore, thank you so much for thank joining you. us for what has been a really f fascinating hour, and we really appreciate you coming uh, virtually and being here with us. And I just want to remind everybody that Wendy's book in the UK is called Endell Street. In the US, it's called No Man's Land. It's uh, easily available out there for you. It's excellent. It's and, outstanding, uh, guys. Really, really good. Is. And I strongly suggest that you, uh, you take a look at it. It's a very worthwhile book. Wendy, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Good luck. Thank you so much to you, Chris and Rick. It's been really lovely to talk to you and uh, to tell you all about the, the story. All right, well, we'll have you on uh, when you get it. your next book done, if we're still doing this. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ah, wow. Chris, you have a, 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 you want to tell us a, about that hospital that's not there anymore. Yeah, no, I, I, I was incredibly moved by the story, and uh, I really wanted to see the hospital to see what was left. And I went to Endell Street, and I took some photographs, and that is the site of the hospital now. Uh, it was torn down. Um, and in the 80s, uh, council flats were put on the site, so that's Endell Street, and that's uh, on the right is where the hospital was. But there is now a, a little plaque there uh, that commemorates um, the site of the hospital, and I think it's terrific that the suffragette colors are on the right of the plaque. Yeah, that's really a, 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 a great tribute, and, uh, and, and at least, you know, it's there to, to remember it by. Yep. Um,
I uh, want to give you a little heads up on what's coming up uh, uh, next week. We are going to be talking to uh, Saul David about his book, Crucible of Hell, which is about the Battle of Okinawa, which is uh, uh, has been called sort of the last uh, great battle or the last battle of World War II. Uh, and um, uh, so that'll be our discussion there. And then uh, just looking a little bit further ahead, Chris, we don't usually do this, but to say looking a little bit further ahead, we have to warn people that coming up on December 27th, two days after Christmas, we are going to take the week off. Oh! I know we are. This may be mind bending. That's why we're giving you a couple of weeks to uh, to be aware of it. Uh, after 40 weeks uh, on, we are taking one week off. And then when we come back on January 4th, we're going to have a special edition of the show where we're going to focus on World War II movies, and we're going to be looking for your input for that January 4th show. So you don't have to give us input yet, but you can think about it, and we'll talk to you a little bit more next week about how you can, um, uh, how you can participate, participate in that show. And we hope to have some of you actually on the show. So uh, we, we're kind of trying to uh, blow it out there uh, uh, when we come back in 2021. So, um, Chris, I think I think we've done it. I think we've finished think up another it. show. So, yep. excellent. Talk. Anything left? No? Nope. Buy the book. Be safe. And see you next week. Be good. Be good.